Thank you. I was getting my personal instructions on uh, getting all the AV to work, so thanks. Um, so I, I just wanted to, uh, to thank Dr. Shaw for inviting me. This has uh, been very interesting to learn about the, the foundation and all the great work that's being done and to hear some of the talks. So. Um, all right, so I'm going to be talking about lung cancer, so a shift from hematological malignancies. And I'm going to be focusing on what we know the most about, so EGFR, ELK, and then other targets, um, and sort of go from there. And I do have a few cases embedded. So first of all, I wanted to show you this uh, pie chart, and this keeps changing almost every few months. We have a new target in lung cancer that's become clinically relevant. Um, and you can see that there's still a large white section, which is the we don't know. Um, KRAS is a big piece of the pie where we know what it is, but we don't necessarily know what to do about it. Um, but then many of those other slices actually have very important clinical implications, and we can change the treatment for our patients if we find those. Um, so EGFR, again, is what I'll focus on the most, and then ALK, but even those smaller pieces, so HER2, BRAF, those actually matter clinically now for lung cancer patients, and when we find those driver mutations, we actually have whole new therapeutic options for them, which we're borrowing from what's been learned in other malignancies as well. Okay, so with EGFR. All right, so this is the first case, um, and I'll do this and then switch over to the uh, response system, if I can make that work. Uh, so the patient, um, NR, is a 63-year-old. He's an active smoker, uh, I'm sorry, never smoker, active hiker, um, and has some increasing shortness of breath. He's got dullness about one-third of the way up on a left lung exam when he goes to see his physician. Chest X-ray shows that there's an effusion, and the CT scan shows that there's a mass in the left lung, a moderate-sized effusion, multiple smaller pulmonary nodules bilaterally, so not looking so good. Um, the cytology from the effusion shows it's an adenocarcinoma. A PET and um, brain MRI don't show any other sites of disease besides this extensive left lung involvement. Okay, so now I'm supposed to, I'm going to see if I can make this work. So we switch over to this. All right, um, and then hopefully you can use your buttons to uh, choose. Um, so the patient's had a biopsy. Um, he has a EGFR exon 19 deletion. So what would you like to start? Erlotinib, erlotinib plus bevacizumab, afatinib, or gefitinib? I might not have made it work right. Oh, that's because I accidentally skipped ahead. <laughs> oh, that's because I did. I skipped ahead. So I read you the wrong one. So ignore what I said and just do what you read there. Um, <laughs> Okay, so cytog um, the cytological sample is insufficient for molecular testing, and he feels well after thoracentesis. Um, so the first step is, do you start pemetrexid um, and platinum? Do you start carboplatin, paclitaxel, bevacizumab, or do you biopsy the left lung mass and await molecular results, ignoring what I said when I skipped to the next slide, right? <laughs> okay. Okay, and we've got people voting now. Great, so most of you were voting for biopsy, perhaps led by my uh, reading you the next slide, but good. <laughs> All right, um, so next slide. Uh, the patient does have um, the next the biopsy done. So two weeks after this, um, you see that he does have, indeed have an exon 19 deletion in EGFR. So then the question is, what do you start? Erlotinib, erlotinib plus bevacizumab, afatinib, or gefitinib? So please vote there. Okay. I'm obviously not gifted with this, even though I came from Silicon Valley. There we go. Okay. Um, so we've got uh, what I can see, and I don't know if you guys can see it, but we had 36% uh, voted for option A, 31% for B, 15% for C, and 18% for D. And uh, so that was most people voting for erlotinib, some for the combination of erlotinib and bevacizumab, interestingly, um, in the teens for afatinib or gefitinib. And keeping in mind that all of those are actually approved options. The bevacizumab's not necessarily approved in that setting, but you can get it, and we'll go through the data on those. Okay, so then after initial response to the TKI, the patient does very well for 14 months, but starts to develop widespread progression, liver, adrenals, lungs. So now what do you do? 
Platinum pemetrexid, afatinib, rosalitinib on trial, electinib on trial. If you don't know what those are, you will by the end of the day. Okay, so we'll see if you can vote again here. I've done something wrong, so uh, we'll just do a show of hands. Okay. So basically, again, any there's only one wrong option here. Well, two. Um, so platinum pemetrexid would be what I would expect most people to vote for, and that would be the appropriate now going to an appropriate platinum doublet combination chemotherapy. That's what we would do. The use of a fatinib, which is an EGFR drug, so it's not completely wrong to switch from that, but the activity of that right after someone's been on a second generation or first generation EGFR TKI isn't so high. Um, rosalitinib is um, on trial, will likely be an option for us in the next few months, and we'll go through data from that. It's also called CL1686, it's a third generation TKI. And the last one, election, it's an ALK inhibitor, so that's the wrong response. Okay, so moving on to the data. So with lung cancer, we didn't know all of this molecular stuff a decade ago. We kind of fell into it when these drugs that hit EGFR were developed. So the first was a drug called gefitinib, and it was developed because people noticed that there were high levels of EGFR expression in many lung cancers, and so it seemed like a reasonable target to go after. So EGFR TKIs were developed, and it was noticed that for about 10% of patients, there were very, very dramatic responses. So questions were there, and people looked into EGFR in more detail, did sequencing of the tumors for patients with these responses, and found particular patterns of mutations. And in patients who had those mutations, they were the ones having dramatic responses to gefitinib. And people who didn't have that didn't have those responses. And they also discovered that there seemed to be a specific phenotype, that people who had never smoked, were, tended to be women, were Asian, were more likely to have these responses, and indeed were more likely to have these mutations. But in the early days, we didn't know that there was that strong connection, and so there were trials developed. This most common and famous one is called IPASS, in which patients in Asia who were non-smokers who had adenocarcinoma lung cancer were randomized to get an EGFR drug or to get chemotherapy. And what this slide is showing you um, is that the patients who, oh, keep switching ahead to the wrong slide, sorry, okay, um, is that the patients who had the mutation, sorry, the patients without the mutation, so all comers, these folks were actually not being served by starting on an EGFR drug. They were much better off getting chemotherapy, but the people who did have the mutation were, were doing much better by getting the EGFR drug up front. So if you had the mutation and you got the EGFR-targeted therapy, your progression-free survival was much better than if you got chemo. But if you didn't have the mutation, even though you fit the phenotype, you didn't do very well. You were much better off getting the chemotherapy. And so this changed the paradigm of how we treat first-line lung cancer. So now we test, and if we find an EGFR mutation, we can start with an EGFR drug. And if we don't, we start with chemotherapy, which has been the standard all along. And that really made us start thinking about testing. Now, there's some subtle differences. So there are multiple different drugs, and we'll get to a slide about those. Um, one of the newest drugs that was approved is a fatinib. So it's also just it's a second-generation EGFR-TKI instead of a first-generation EGFR-TKI. It is more potent. Um, in this subset that was done, they looked at different EGFR mutations, so there, it gets the first theory was you have an EGFR mutation or you don't, and now we realize the different EGFR mutations are actually quite different, and I'm going to go into more detail about this. The biggest division is between the two most common, deletion 19 and L858R. Um, and so in this particular analysis of these two trials that you looked at a fatinib versus chemotherapy, the patients that had the deletion 19 mutation, they seem to have an, a much stronger benefit from getting first line of fatinib versus the chemotherapy, and those who had the L858R, in general, it really wasn't that clear that there was that much difference between starting on chemo, starting on EGFR-TKI. So basic principle being that the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. Um, so it's simple to say, if someone has an activating EGFR mutation, they should start on an EGFR-TKI. And now we realize you can't just say activating EGFR mutation. You have to know, well, is it deletion 19? Is it L858R? Is it one of the many others that we can look for? And so the story gets more and more complex over time. Okay. Um, and then we can add another drug. So this is the um, bevacizumab data. So that was one of your options. A lot of people voted for that. So why would you add bevacizumab, a VEGF antibody, to erlotinib, an EGFR-TKI? 
And the reason is because of this randomized phase two study, but it's randomized phase two, so it's not the truth yet. This is just an indication that perhaps this is gonna be more helpful. So this was a study done in Japan, again, randomized phase two, and people with an activating EGFR mutation, so it was deletion 19 or L858R, they got erlotinib and then were randomized to either get bevacizumab or not. Um, and what this curve is showing is that for those on the bevacizumab arm, in this trial, the progression-free survival was much better if you were also getting bevacizumab. Of course, there were some toxicities brought in with that, and we don't have the overall survival data yet. So this is being replicated, hopefully. Um, the, the trial's being done in the US on a smaller standpoint, um, and it's unclear how much data do we need to say, yes, this is what we should do. When I've been prescribing this for a few patients, I've had to have uh, you know, the multiple discussions with the uh, insurance agencies to get the approvals to go forward, but have mostly been able to go ahead. However, this isn't yet in NCCN guidelines. It's not necessarily recommended, but it fits with earlier data we'd seen with this combination, which looked promising. But at that time, most of it was done sort of in a broader patient population, not just in those with the activating mutations. And so it's a lot of extrapolation still, but that's why that was one of the choices. Okay, and then to confuse you further, it's not just about erlotinib, gefitinib, and efatinib anymore. Now there's, well, there are at least six new EGFR TKIs in development that have had data presented and probably many, many more than that. So I wanted to focus on updates from ASCO this year, um, and this is one of the drugs that was talked about there. This is AZD3759, so early enough not to even have a name, um, and this one, has very good blood-brain penetration. Um, and that's one of the challenges. We know that for patients with brain, so the EGFR mutation lung cancer goes to the brain very, very commonly. And for many patients, the site of failure of the drug is in the brain. Though, we also know that you can sometimes hold off on radiation for patients with brain metastases if they're getting the drugs because they get in so well. But we're left with challenges there. And so this new drug, the focus of it is it's, it's still kind of a first generation EGFR TKI. It's not getting resistance mechanisms, but it gets into the brain well. So this was looking promising. And this is just showing some um, responses in the brain. I was actually impressed last night as I was looking at my slides. My nine-year-old looked like, she's like, Mom, is that a brain? I was like, yes. So, <laughs> so there's hope. <laughs> My 12-year-old was most annoyed that the nine-year-old knew that, but uh, anyway. Okay, and so this is just showing some, some good responses in the brain. Okay, um, and that's just a table, again, talking about some of the toxicities. Okay, so what about all the other data to support our use of EGFR TKIs? Um, this slide is a, a summary slide, and I think it helps to put everything in context. So I showed you the IPASS data, just one slide from that, but that was the first big trial of EGFR TKI versus chemo for people. In, I showed you the data for those with the mutations. Um, and there have been multiple trials since then, which instead of just saying the clinical look, they looked at the mutation. So patients with a known mutation who either got an EGFR TKI or got chemo, there have now been multiple studies. They've all shown the same thing, which is the EGFR TKI has a higher response than chemo in patients with these mutations, and the progression-free survival is better with the EGFR TKI versus the chemo. Um, however, it's still not a great progression-free survival. It's still only around a year. And you say, well, that's great compared to what we used to have for lung cancer, but it's still not great if you're a patient who's just been diagnosed with lung cancer. And many of these patients are in their 30s, 40s, 50s. You know, this is what my patient population looks like in Northern California. Um, so this is the challenge, is what do we do here at this point where everyone starts to progress? How do we move beyond that? For a long time, we'd only had chemo, but now we have better understanding of what's going on. And so that better understanding is highlighted here in this pie chart. Uh, this is looking at the resistance mechanisms. So when someone has a tumor that's sensitive to an EGFR TKI and it stops being sensitive, 60% of the time that's because a new mutation is developed, and that new mutation is called T790M, changes the binding pocket so that those first, second generation EGFR TKIs can't bind very well. So this had been a, known for a while and many, many compounds developed to try to hit it, but until recently we hadn't been very successful. There are also other things that can happen. So you can get MET amplification. You can actually get transformation from non-small cell to small cell. So I remember being in the audience when this was first presented and everyone said, what? But then it turns out this is true and it's been replicated over and over again. So the tumor figure out other ways around this inhibition of EGFR. 
Okay. So that has led to then development of these new drugs, um, which hit T790M. They're just tweaking what part of EGFR you get. The first and second generations hit the activating mutations. They also hit some wild type, which is why you get the rash. These don't hit the wild types. So you don't get the rash. They hit the activating, but they also get T790M, which is that resistance mutation. And this plot is just showing that if someone had had an EGFR TKI, it stopped working, and they got rosalitinib, and they happened to have the T790M mutation, um, they would have a very high likelihood of response. This is about a 60% response mate rate. This is the CO1686. This drug has been filed with the FDA, so hopefully it'll be something we have as an option soon. A very similar compound is this AZT, AZD9291. Again, this is a similar curve showing that in patients who had an EGFR TKI, either erlotinib or chafitinib, it stopped working, they had the T790M, they got the drug, they were most likely to respond. But with both of these drugs, the response time is still less than what we'd like it to be. It's that same dramatic, you start the drug, the patient feels better within days, it's fabulous, but then some number of months later, symptoms start coming up again. There are newer drugs as well. This is a EGF-816, uh, and this is, again, a similar curve showing high rates of response. And another one, ASP-8273. Again, I'm not going to go through the details. It's just that, you know, this, this curve gets very predictable. Um, and when we put a, I, I tried, I put this, uh, table together for an ASCO discussion this year and was struck as I was pulling out all the data, again, with how similar those responses are. So when you look into this column, the response rates in patients who have developed T790M as their resistance mechanism, they're pretty much all hitting that 60% mark, which is great. It's the majority of patients. And in that 40% where they're not responding, many of them are having minor responses. So this is very, very hopeful and encouraging. Where the challenge remains is this progression time. So these numbers, these progression-free survival numbers, keep changing every time these drugs are presented. They're sort of, it's like every time there's a press release, it's like this, it's a little, a little crazy. Um, and the reason for that is because they still haven't hit the median. So when you haven't hit your median and you're trying to estimate PFS, it's gonna change. So some presentations have had things as high as 12 or 13 months, some down as far as, as to eight months. We don't know what the final is gonna end up being. I don't think that they're that similar. Where there are differences between these compounds is in the toxicities. So with the rosalitinib, there's a hyperglycemia, has to do with the metabolite hitting insulin growth factor receptor. With AZD9291, there's some diarrhea. Both drugs are reasonably well tolerated, and with these newer ones coming out, some unusual rashes, hyponatremia, you know, different things, because these are still tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and tyrosine, tyrosine kinase inhibitors tend to hit other tyrosine kinases, and that's what distinguishes the drugs and leads to variable toxicities. So lots of excitement, lots of encouragement, still challenges, though. And there, we have to look into questions of resistance, too. So response rates 50 to 60%, progress being made, but doubtful that we're gonna exceed a 12-month progression-free survival. So how do we do better? Do we look into first line? And there was some data at ASCO this year with the AZD compound. Do we look at combinations? Lots of combination studies being done, of course, with checkpoint inhibitors, which um, the second speaker in this session is gonna focus on those. Um, MET, VEGF, resistance differs, and so we'll talk about that. Um, can we sequence these agents? So if you start with the first generation and get your year, and then you start with the third generation and get your year, that's certainly better than starting with the third generation and only getting 13 months, right? So these are, again, lots of questions that we still need to do. And then the brain metastases challenge comes up too, and the cost. Um, so this is the first line data with the AZD9291, showing a response rate that's a little better than, 70 per, than 60%, um, somewhere in that 70% range. But we don't have the PFS yet, the progression time. There's some estimates, but still pretty early. There's a lot of work being done with these drugs and others, trying to figure out you know, answers to those questions I was bringing up. What about first line? Uh, what about after progression? What about versus chemo? What about combinations? And so the development of these two is very similar, um, and they're not clear which one's gonna be approved first, but likely we'll have one or both of them in the near future. And then the other drugs, very similar study designs, focusing in on other subsets like um, T7, uh, the uh, Exxon 20. Okay. Now, what about, uh, these are resistance develops, like I mentioned, and there is some rapidly growing field uh, looking at resistance in these drugs. So, RAS map signaling is important. Um, 
new resistance mutations are also being found, especially this uh, C797S. This is a very potent resistant mechanism. So when that mutation develops, doesn't matter what you throw at it, none of these drugs seem to work at all. And clinically, we're also finding different mechanisms of resistance with the drugs. So with AZD9291, especially looking with a cell-free DNA analysis, you can get, you have resistance was looked at. Um, six of these patients had that C797S resistance mutation. So that's a real thing. Um, four of them lost T790M. They hadn't reported any small cell yet. Lots of work still being done looking for that. With the rosalitinib and tissue biopsies that were paired, None of the patients had the C797S, but many of the patients actually transformed into small cell. So that was what we'd seen with the earlier drugs. Now we're seeing it with these third generation drugs as well. Okay, so talked about the two common, the Lucia 19, L858R, talked about T790M, the major resistance mechanism. But when we look, we realize that there are actually other EGFR mutations as well. So 85% or so of all activating EGFR mutations or all de novo EGFR mutations are this, uh, those two, deletion 19, LA58R, but there's 10 to 15% of others. We didn't use to find those because we didn't use to look for them, but now that we're looking for them, we are identifying them. And so I'm not gonna expect you to memorize all this. There are lots of places to go. So mycancergenome.org is one good website to review. There are lots of ways to look these up. If you get a report and it's not deletion 19 or L858R, what do you do with it? Um, so there's a lot of exon 18s, the G719, and then different substitutions there. Exon 20 insertions tend to be resistant. Um, these other, this one tends to be sensitive. This is the T790M we talked about. And then exon 21, there's also a sensitizing mutation. Um, the French are doing this amazing work where they're actually sequencing non-small cell adenocarcinoma tumors of almost any patient who comes in to a, a center in France. So a wealth of data from that. They looked at over 10,000 patients and found that about 10% had these rare EGFR mutations. 5% um, were exon 20 and then lesser frequencies of the others. And in work from Taiwan, they've looked at some of these rare mutations as well and said, well, what does it mean for response? And you can see that the response rates tend to be in the 40 to 60% range, so kind of close to what we see with the normal mutate, the common mutations. A um, little bit less, these tend to be 60 to 70%, but still pretty good. And so for most of these, if you see it, you should treat it like you would a deletion 19 or L858R, just knowing it's not gonna do quite as well. Those patients aren't gonna do quite as well. The tumor's not gonna respond as long. Um, exon 20 insertions are a bigger challenge. It's about five to 10% of all EGFR mutations. Uh, again, more common in the same subsets that get other EGFR mutations, but unfortunately, these don't do as well. They don't respond to the typical EGFR drugs. Um, there are a lot of different options, a lot of different insertions that have been found. Um, so this year at ASCO, there was some promise with a new compound that's just an HSP90 inhibitor, AUI922, which did show responses in these patients, but progression-free survival, unfortunately limited. Okay, so what about EGFR? There are three approved first and second generation EGFR TKIs, promising new EGFR TKIs with T790M activity. We need to determine the role in first line versus later, how to differentiate the third generations. Maybe HSP90 inhibition is gonna help for exon 20. There's other work being done there too. And there's new insights into why these drugs stop working. Okay, so now we get another case. Um, so this is a 57-year-old African-American man he smoked a little bit for 10 years, and he has progressive right-sided chest pain. Uh, chest X-ray shows pleural thickening, he has a mass. CT shows that he's got adrenal mass, right lung mass, pleural studying on the right. Biopsy shows adenocarcinoma, um, but no other sites of disease are identified. So, um, FISH is done for ALK, it's negative. There are no EGFR mutations identified either, and that's where it stopped, it was just looking at EGFR and ALK. Um, so at this point, do you start platinum, pemetrexid? Do you start carboplatin, paclitaxel, bevacizumab, or do you send tissue for NGS? And since I've been not very good at this, we'll just raise hands. So A, platinum, pemetrexid, okay. B, carbotaxel, bevacizumab, okay. And C, send tissue for NGS. Okay, so a smattering of all of these. We've looked for the two most common, right? Those were negative. Um, 
So he just goes starts on chemo. He gets carboplatin, pemetrexid, and actually does really well. His chest pain's better. He starts on maintenance after four cycles. He gets 10, but then he stops because he's starting to get really, really fatigued. Um, stable disease continues for six more months, and then he starts to recur. Uh, he's got liver metastases. So at this point, would you get a biopsy to send for next-gen sequencing? Yes or no? Getting nods? Okay, right. Well, I'm giving a talk on molecular targeting lung cancer, so hopefully you're all nodding. Okay. So a biopsy is performed, and lo and behold, he does have an ALK rearrangement. So what do you start now? Crizotinib, seritinib, restart pemetrexid, or electinib on trial? You don't need to vote. Any of these are reasonable. Uh, you couldn't, wouldn't get seritinib approved because it's only approved after people have had crizotinib, and you could only get electinib on trial. But you could certainly argue to restart pemetrexid. It was still working. He stopped it because he just wanted to stop it, um, or crizotinib. So that gets us to ALK. So ALK was first identified now about six years ago as a driver mutation in lung cancer based on some elegant work done in Japan. And this is some ALK demographics work um, that I was involved in where we did a real world survey of oncologists in the United States and said, well, now that we look for ALK, who has it? Is it all Asian never smokers uh, who tend to be women like with EGFR? And the answer is no, it's not all that demographic and we really need to be mindful of testing all people with adenocarcinoma of the lung and other people with lung cancer who don't fit into the classic 100-pack year smokers with squamous. And even sometimes they're going to have mutations also. So we need to be thinking about testing. So in this analysis, kind of the high points, because I know it's a little bit hard to read, the um, median age was 67. So these are not all young patients. It's true, they tend to, there's a predominance towards young, but there are a lot of patients who are older. Um, the ethnicity was quite variable. Um, in this analysis, there were 18% African-American patients, 59% Caucasian, 13% Asian, 8% Hispanic Latino, um, and then others. And again, it wasn't fully worked out. And this was somewhat biased as well because it was sort of a, in your practice, where you, and you've tested who had SACE, who has ALK. Um, this was, again, it was predominantly in the south of the United States and west. This is also important to note that many of these patients had a smoking history, so it's not all the non-smokers. You got to test even if someone has a smoking history. Okay, um, so I'll move on from that. And this is the data you all know that crizotinib works beautifully in people with alk translocations. So this is a waterfall plot showing very, very high responses. This is, of course, old data now. This is 10 years ago, but led to the drug approval. Um, when it was compared now head-to-head, -head, crizotinib versus first-line chemo, same sort of results that you see with EGFR drugs. If you have the target, you hit the target properly, you're gonna have a better response and a better progression time with the targeted drug. We don't have the survival results in the study yet. We have other drugs that work. So this is the ASCEND one, which is looking at seritinib in patients um, who have either had or not had prior crizotinib. And this was striking because the responses were about the same whether or not a patient had had crizotinib, but the duration of response was longer if they had not. So that gets into that sequencing question again. Um, electinib, another very active ALK drug, similar waterfall plot. Longer progression-free survival. In, um, so this is, the, sorry, not longer, but a long one. So this is for electinib and patients who'd had crizotinib, showing a progression-free survival still under a year, but in the nine-month range. This is looking at electinib in patients with brain metastases. One of the myths around crizotinib, it doesn't get in the brain, it does. It just doesn't get in the brain as well as seritinib, which is the LDK378, the approved drug, or electinib, which is coming along. So both of those have very high CNS penetration. So this is just showing that in the brain, the response rate was close to 60% in this small analysis, a little bit lower if you included all people with brain mets, not all of which are measurable. Similar data exist with um, seritinib as well. Um, and then this is electinib in patients who had previously had crizotinib, again, showing high responses. This is from ASCO this year, and more. Um, again, focusing in on the brain and showing activity there. Okay, other ALK drugs in development, this is one of those. Again, showing high responses, 40 to 50%. Again, more activity being shown in the brain and high responses in the brain. So, to summarize ALK, first-line ALK TKI therapy is the standard of care for patients with ALK translocations. Crizotinib right now is our only approved drug. Attempts to prevent resistance are very exciting, um, and overcoming resistance. So overcoming, seritinib is approved. There are a lot of other ALK drugs. Electinib is likely going to be approved sometime in the near future. 
There's significant CNS activity seen with many of these drugs. The toxicities, again, are variable. Some have rash, there's edema, there's bradycardia, there's vision changes, there's diarrhea. You know, they're all quite variable, but usually pretty well managed. Okay, so that brings us to other targets, because I know I'm a little over my time now that I had to start late, so it's not all my fault. Okay. Um, so drivers, again, we've seen this pie chart before. This is the sort of updated one. Bringing in MET, so MET mutations are the big news of 2015. So we know about MET in lung cancer. We know MET overexpression is an issue, but now we've identified MET trans, actually they're, um, they're splice variants, but it's a, it's a true driver mutation, so we'll get to that data. Um, so RET is another one. I've got a couple patients I know have RET, and we now have drugs that can target that and trials ongoing. So cabozantinib, this one comes up quite a bit because it's a very dirty tyrosine kinase, so it hits a lot of different targets. Um, and for that reason, it's active against a lot of different targets, and it's not the easiest drug to take, but no worse than many. Um, it primarily was developed as a VEGFR TKI, but it also hits MET quite well and then multiple other targets. So in RET, rearranged lung cancer, good waterfall plot, very exciting. Unfortunately, the progression time leaves a little bit to be desired. What about BRAF? So we all know about BRAF, melanoma. However, V600E mutations are also found in lung cancer. This is actually a New England Journal article that just came out a couple weeks ago, look, or last week, um, looking at BRAF, V600E across the spectrum of different diseases. So in lung cancer, if you find a BRAF, V600E mutation, those patients respond really, really well to BRAF drugs. So there's data with bemurafenib, there's data with dibrafenib, and now the dibrafenib plus trametinib data was presented at ASCO this year and now has a FDA fast track um, approval that's going through. And that's because of this 63% response rate. Again, it's very, very rapid. Um, and this looks like it's going to last longer than with dibrafenib alone. It does in melanoma. We don't know that yet for sure in lung cancer, but that's the theory by combining. Um, and then the, MEX, the MET Exxon 14, I mentioned this. So this is, there's very limited data. There's a few case series now. This was a poster at ASCO based on four patients. Four patients, right? But because you can find the target, you know what to target the target with, and then you get responses, that's a very clear, understandable story and worth getting out there. Um, so in patients who have this, there was a three of three of them responded well to crizotinib. So remember, crizotinib is not just ALK, it hits MET as well. It was predominantly a MET inhibitor. That's how it was developed. So if you get a good MET drug and you treat, you're going to get a response. And then cabozantinib, we heard about that one before. That also works because it's also hitting MET. This is an important analysis that was done looking at, and kind of our case two uh, is like this also, and I've, case two is a, a patient of mine. Um, this is a, a patient who had had initial testing, was negative, right? And yet, when you go and really look, you find mutations. So this was work done by Memorial Sloan Kettering, where they had 31 patients who were young and never smokers and didn't have a driver mutation identified, but everyone thought that they really probably did. And sure enough, most of them did. Um, and so in this, 26% of the patients had a known actionable driver mutation identified when they relooked. 40% had a driver mutation that might be actionable still in trials. And so it was the majority of these patients really did have activating mutations if we looked well enough. However, we don't always have tissue, and so now there's a lot of work being done with serum testing. So these are, uh, this is just from a presentation done at ASCO with the rosalitinib, the um, third generation EGFR TKI, looking for T790M. But this is being done across multiple different mutations as well. There are commercial companies available, a lot of research being done here as well. Where you can take plasma, um, you can then isolate the tumor DNA as well as the other DNA, you separate that out, and if you, especially if you know what mutations to look for, you can actually do very nice work with PCR trying to identify those. And so from this particular trial, what was shown was that there was a very high correlation for the activating mutations. It was a 81% positive predictive agreement between the two. And for T790M, that was also quite high. And so we're probably moving towards an era where instead of having to always biopsy the tumor, you can just take that blood sample, 
and look for your activating mutations. If you find them, you're done. If you don't, you probably need to do more testing. Uh, same with T790M, and you can serially follow these. So this is research we're doing, many other people are doing as well, where every time the patient's coming in, especially around a scan time, you're drawing the blood and you're looking to see if you're identifying the T790M. With ALK, it's gonna be trickier because there are a lot of other resistance mechanisms. I didn't go into that today. Okay, so final slide. In conclusion, um, we have promising new EGFR TKIs with T790M activity, rosuletinib, AZD9291, others. There's promising ALK TKIs with activity beyond crizotinib, so electinib, the new Pfizer compound, X396, and multiple others. There's new insight with recent publications into why those drugs stop working. So we know why the first generation ALK and first generation EGFR drugs stop working. Now we're starting to figure out why the next generation ones don't work as well. And there are a lot of other targets that we need to be aware of to best treat our patients. So re consider repeat testing and look to the future with serum testing. So thank you. Thank you.